swaha tatsavi tur varenyam bhargo devasya dhimahi diyo yo na prachodayat Hello, and welcome to our new series on Gayatri Mantra. I've been chanting Gayatri since about 1975. I was initiated into it by my Adi Guru, Bhaktivedanta Swami, or Srila Prabhupada, as he's popularly known. And uh, in the beginning, I didn't really take it too seriously. It was more of a mm, status symbol in that environment. Uh, it wasn't a big practice. We were encouraged to chant only three times a day, 10 mantras each time. <laughs> so 30 mantras a day is not going to give you much experience with the Gayatri Mantra. And uh, I persisted in it as a formality for many years, but never really recognized its value or its effect. And I attribute that to that I didn't do enough of it. To really get to know any mantra, you have to do a lot of it, any spiritual practice or anything at all. If you want to play music well, you have to practice eight hours a day, 10 hours, 12 hours a day for a significant length of time. If you want to become a great writer, you have to try again and again and tear up so many drafts and start over again until you get it. And that's just the beginning. Anything that's worth doing well requires a significant investment of time and energy. Now, here we're talking about a mantra. But what is a mantra? It's really a method of experiencing happiness. Now, we don't often look critically at our ways of attaining happiness. But if we do, we find that conventional methods of material uh, engagement to attain happiness don't work very well. Their success is more or less a crapshoot, you know? It's more or less uh, a gamble. We don't really know if we're going to work. And when they do work, we don't really know why. And then their results are also temporary. And even when we get what we want, it soon fades away and disappears. So the whole process of material enjoyment is just fraught with all kinds of difficulties. We want something, and then we find we have to do all these other things to get it. Things that we really would rather not have to do. So people are chasing all around, trying to make money to buy a new car, to buy nice clothes, to go to the best school and this and that, just so that they get better sex life or they get a more stable family life or some form of material happiness. But then when they get it, they'll find it's not perfect. It's got some downsides, always some an unanticipated problems. So this material happiness is really not what we are looking for. We're looking for unconditional happiness, isn't it? Happiness that's not limited by certain material conditions in the world. Happiness that's not proscribed by time. Huh? Happiness that can deliver results unconditionally over an unlimited span of time. That's the kind of happiness that's available through mantras like Gayatri. Of course, the Gayatri mantra that we chant is only one of a big family of Gayatris. Gayatri is a meter, a 12 syllable or 24 syllable, I should say, pada. 12 syllables or 24 padas uh, meter in Sanskrit poetry. So uh, a pada is like a, um, I guess the closest Western term would be a phenom, uh, a unit of pronunciation. 
and you have long and short padas. You know, for example, uh, mala. Mala is two short padas, and it means a fault, a problem. Uh, but mala, with two long padas, means a uh, chanting beats like this, with 108 beats that you use to count your mantras. So whether you have a mala or a mala <laughs> is going to make a big difference. And so the, the long syllables are two padas, or two beats in length, whereas the short syllables only one. That makes a big difference in the meaning and in the rhythm of the mantra. To really be effective, the mantra should be chanted in the proper rhythm as well as in the proper pronunciation. So we'll get into all of this in the detailed videos. I just wanted to tell you that, uh, to underline that for the first many, many years that I chanted these mantras, I didn't pay much attention to the meter. And I think a big reason for that was I was involved with a group that was doing a lot of kirtan. And in kirtan, the musical features of the melody and the expression often become more important than the actual uh, proper rhythm or, or meter of the text itself. And that's a problem because the rhythm or matra, again, two long vowels, the matra of a mantra, is going to determine the mood that it subconsciously um, uh, distills into your heart and mind. Okay, so there's a difference, a, a notable difference between chanting a mantra in a kirtan tune and chanting it in its native matra or uh, its proper rhythm. Uh, uh, in South India is here especially, there is a great science of talam. Talam means musical rhythm. And just by playing drums in a certain rhythm, one can induce a certain mood in a whole crowd of people. And they do it all the time. It's really amazing to see. People will come into a temple just off the street, you know, with all that street energy and street vibes. And then somebody will start playing a drum. Usually they also have a Shanai or a Nagaswami, like a big long oboe type instrument. And, uh, but nobody really pays much attention to that. It's the drum that they pay attention to because that sets the mood. It starts people's hearts and circulation beating in unison, in rhythm. So this is how mood is created by the rhythm of a mantra. The rhythm is very important, matra huh? or meter. So in the same way, the meaning of the mantra is important. We were taught a meaning of Gayatri Mantra that was very theistic and very external, that the mantra was simply to worship the sun or God as the sun. But once you look into the meaning, do a little research, you find out it's much, much deeper than that. And it goes way back to the original Vedas and Upanishads, which were not the worship of a personal God at all. The ultimate God, Brahman, was considered impersonal, and that all the other gods with form are emanations from him. So the actual meaning of Gayatri Mantra is probably something that the theistic uh, teachers don't want to discuss too much. Uh, but if you trace it back to its origins in the original Vedic literatures, you find it's quite clear. The mantra is to invoke the presence of Brahman, the impersonal absolute, and highlight or bring awareness to our relationship with him. How each individual being is the reflection of Brahman. Just like the example is given, after a storm, the moon is reflected in many puddles. So it's the same moon. And if we look up in the sky, we'll see the same shape, the same light. But the reflection in the puddle is very small. Or like the sun or any other object reflected in a mirror. 
The mirror doesn't think about what it wants to reflect. It simply reflects whatever is put in front of it. Similarly, the mind reflects whatever we direct our attention toward. If we direct our attention toward matter, the satisfaction and the happiness that we get is going to be very conditional, very temporary, and ultimately unsatisfying. But if we direct our attention toward the Supreme, Brahman, uh, the Absolute, the happiness derived from that is unconditional and everlasting. So please uh, investigate this Gayatri Mantra. Try the practice for yourself. Uh, after watching the videos, sit down and actually chant the mantra out loud if you have to, but it's best to chant in the mind silently and considering or meditating on the meaning as well. So we wish you all happiness, all the best, the best of luck to you. Om Hari Om. Swaha Tatsavi Turvarenyam Bargo Devasya Vimahi Dio Yona Prachodayat